friend, just to be honest with you, they're family, they're not just friends, Dr. Randy Caldwell. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want to begin reading in verse number 15. I usually have you stand to your feet, so if you're in the car, just stretch your legs out like you're standing, all right? Uh, verse number 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as small dust on the balances, on the scale. Behold, he, God, taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon, where they used to get the cedars to burn, the cedar trees. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will we liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? The Bible says that when there, when, when you compare God to all the nations, they are nothing and they are less than nothing. So I want to talk to you for about the next 30 or 40 minutes today from the subject of when there is nothing, there is still God. <laughs> hey, honk a big loud amen. I've been doing a lot of studying here, and I, I, I've been teaching. Matter of fact, our second video went out yesterday on social media about the Knesset menorah. When I began to look uh, a few weeks ago, and I was teaching on social media, uh, there was questions began to be asked to me: What is the menorah sitting on your shelf there in your in your office behind your desk? And I, I, I was really kind of got my feelings hurt just a little bit, Pastor Todd. That that uh, they was more concerned about what was on the shelf behind me than what I was saying. So I guess I was being a little bit boring. But uh, nonetheless, I, I began to look at it, and then I. I, I, I literally, in the, for two weeks now, have been up to 2, 3, 4, and even 5 o'clock in the morning. One morning, saw the sun begin to come up when I began to look at the, the menorah. In case you don't know what a menorah is, it's, it's like a candlestick, and it has got seven branches on it, and it is the national symbol of the nation of Israel. And when I began to look at it, the people and the characters that they put on that menorah, I just began to study them, Pastor. I began to look at them, and... And the first one I began to study was Isaiah. And then I ran across this scripture. I've read the book of Isaiah about three times in the last 9, 10, 11 days. And, and I ran across this scripture here and it reminded me of an old sermon that I used to preach entitled that I just gave you, When There Is Nothing, There Is God. And I thought, how appropriate would it be today for us to understand that even, look here, even if, if, if we never ever got to meet again, and that's not going to happen, we're going to meet again, but even if there was nothing, if we had, to, if we were secluded and we were locked down for, for the next year and a half and it seemed like we had nothing left, you need to understand that when there is nothing, when it looks like you've got nowhere to turn, when it looks like that you don't know the answer, when you don't have anything, there is still God. He is not dead. He has not gone on vacation. He has not passed away. He has not forgotten the promises that he has said to you or to your family or about these very grounds that we're sitting on. Isaiah wrote and said that the nations of this world are counted as the small dust on the scales. I, I don't know if you've ever gone down to the deli department and ordered yourself a two pounds of turkey and about three pounds of Colby Jack cheese and, and sourdough bread. Boy, I'm going to tell you, my wife can put butter. Listen, I think butter is good for you, okay? Uh, that we, We've been told a lot of things in the past that, that, that we paid more attention. Leave it alone, Randy. Just leave that alone, okay? Let's move on right now. But Isaiah said that the nations of this world are counted as a small dust on the scales. If you've ever ordered a pound of turkey, a couple pounds of cheese, you don't look at the at the butcher and say, hey, before you, before you get ready to weigh up that lunch meat and that cheese... 
I need you to dust off them scales because I don't want to have to pay for any dust particles that are on there. You don't say that. Why? Because it don't even matter. It doesn't even register. And I've been reading the book of Isaiah and he said, let me tell you something. When you compare all the great governments of this world, when you compare the militaries of all the great nations and all the great power that they could have that literally could set off nuclear bombs that could rock the earth on its axis. It could even tilt it from its axis. Isaiah said you need to understand in the midst of all of that, all their great power, all the great leaders, all their great knowledge. When God looks down, he counts it like dust on the scale compared to God. Why? Because he said there is none above him. He is the highest of the high. He's the mightiest of the mighty. He's the greatest of the great. And there is none above him. It don't matter what the coronavirus rages or not, I'm here to tell you that God's got this thing and he's got a plan and he's going to turn it for your good. Somebody give him praise and honor here today. He's going to turn it for your good. Isaiah said that he counts it as small dust on the scales. He takes up the owls as a very little thing. All the beasts would not be sufficient for a sacrifice unto him and he said they are counted less than nothing. Now, I know what nothing is, but I, I don't know how you get less than nothing. <laughs> well, well, I take that back. I've seen a couple politicians on TV here lately, but that's a whole other story. Amen. Listen, you think it's odd preaching, uh, hearing preaching sitting in your car and a bunch of horns honking. You ought to be standing up here, me and Brother Todd, holding his microphone. Amen. It kind of, he's the first one to honk his horn. Amen. It can throw you off just a little bit after, but, but you understand God really is doing a new thing. And I really, truly believe that there are people that are turning to God that are looking to church. And I'm here to tell you guys, when this thing ends and it's going to end very soon, you need to understand that we We've got to have more than Brother Shoutabout and Sister Hoop and Holler, but we're going to need to have an answer for people that have gone through this thing. Suicide rate, rates are up and people are living in depression and they're going to need more than us just getting together and saying, well, there's a blanket answer. I'm here to tell you it's time that we need to understand, guys, that when they begin to come to the house of God, we've got to have something. I'm afraid that what this has done, I, I, somebody said to Brother Caldwell, my church can't go a month and not meet. I, I, well, I'm going to be honest with you. If your church is dead in four weeks of not meeting, there wasn't a lot of life left in your church to start with. And so you got to understand that God is beginning to use this thing. He's beginning to turn it around. And the church is coming to the forefront. The major news media is carrying church services from Pentecostal preachers to Catholics. I'm trying to tell you this is not a bad thing. I really, truly, as I said a while ago, I believe the devil has had a meeting him with his little imps and his demons and said, boys, you know, the biggest mistake we ever made was crucifying Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, I think we've made a big one in America by trying to shut the church down because when God's people come together again, things are going to begin to change. Somebody give him praise out here today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Things are going to begin to change. They already have begun to change. And Isaiah said, you've got to know and understand that he, that's chapter number 40, and then he keeps writing. Look at the book of Isaiah. And, and, and if you hadn't been watching these social media teachings, um, not just because trying to get views or whatever, I'm just trying to tell you, these teachings that we've been doing on Isaiah, and, and, and somebody help me. Joe, what if somebody uh, help me from my family? What was the one that went out? Was it Abraham yesterday? Somebody help me, wife. Kyla, somebody, honk, cuss, do something. Let me know. Yeah, I, I, I believe it was Abraham that went out yesterday, okay? And so you, you have to understand, we, we, we recorded these teachings, and, and you'll notice the next couple of teachings, I've got long hair. I got a haircut yesterday. I'm so excited. <laughs> I just, I really, I'm just getting so afraid my, my head was going to get hung in a limb and the enemy going to come by and kill me while I was hanging there. But, but, but understand that these teachings that I've been putting out and, and, and these teachings that I've been doing is looking at the men and women of God. These guys did not, and these women did not fall out of heaven and perform a miracle and then go back in after it was over with. I began to look at some of the things that they went through. 
man, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, <laughs> you think this is tough. You ought to have to go through some of the things that God told them to do. God told Abraham, take your son and go over there and kill him. And Abraham was willing to obey. Now, God was not going to let him go through that. But God needed to know where Abraham's heart was. God needed to know. Why? Because God always allows trials and tests to come by our way. Why? Because before you can be blessed, before you can before you can be uh, 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 trusted, you've got to be tested. That's why I believe in what is going on right now with the church world that God is seeing right here in America and around the world that they have become very complacent, but now they are determined to get together, and I believe I can trust them with this new move of God, that I'm this new move I'm going to send to them in the nation. Why? Because, guys, listen to me. We are a part of the grafted in part of Abraham's seed, but you need to know that there is a revival that the news media, and which, by the way, if you're still watching CNN and MNSBC, and if you're still watching that bunch of nuts, uh, you, you need to have a mental check uh, because they're a bunch of liars, amen? And so you got to understand uh, that what the media is not telling you around the world is there's a revival that is taking place among the Arab people, among the Islamic nations, uh, and they're beginning to turn to Jesus Christ, and they're looking for answers. Uh, oh, yeah, you got a bunch of nuts that's on the internet and they say well Jesus Christ is not the only way to God I got some bad news for you I'm not the one that wrote that I'm not the one that said that he's the one that said it that no man comes to the father but by me if you got a problem with it you take it up with him and there's a move that is taking place among the Islamic people that the media will not report about and so you, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> you want to know what your true attitude is? i tell you what your true attitude is. Nothing will reveal your true attitude like your response does in the time of trouble. Now, what I'm seeing is there's some people, okay, there's some people that are in fear and, you know, and, and I, when this thing first started, I, my phone was lighting up and getting calls from preachers across the nation, and we don't know how to have internet service, and <clears throat> we're not going to shut our doors. And, and, and let me tell you something. What, what Pastor Todd has done and what they've done here in the state and across the nation, it's, it's got a little bit of wisdom, okay? And, and listen, and, and thank God, thank God this thing wasn't near what they predicted. All right? And, 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 and I... I I've got my own discussions about that, but we're on live internet, okay? It's not near what near what they predicted, and I thank God. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to the sick. It's very dangerous to the unhealthy. It's very dangerous to the elders. So is a lot of other sicknesses, and, and I understand that. And so them shutting things down of something being this contagious, I do understand. But what I cannot understand for the life of me that people that call themselves Christians and, and, and ministers that are walking in the kind of fear that, they're, that, 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 I'm, that I'm seeing them walk in. Guys, listen to me. You, you, you got to understand that he said that you have the ability to stand up and say that that thing does not come nigh unto my dwelling. It does not come nigh unto my house. It does come not near to my family. You have that authority in Jesus Christ. So what do you do? You want to see what your real attitude is? You want to see where you really are? Look at your response during the time of trouble. And he says, David wrote and said in the word of God that I was young and now I'm old and I ain't never seen the righteous forsaken. The writer in Psalm number 46 said that God is our refuge and our very present help, our refuge, our strength, and our very present help in the time of trouble. Now, I'm not one of these guys that are so blanket that, bless God, we're going to do this. No, I don't want anybody to get sick. I understand that. I don't want to be sick. Oddly enough, I don't want to be sick myself. Okay? And yes, you do take precautions. And we're taking precautions here. But you have to understand what you're learning right now, this week and over the last couple of weeks, that the presence of God can visit you 
right in your car. The presence of God can visit you in your home. And you know what I think needs to happen is these internet servers that we're seeing, these people that are sitting there, people in the car, you need to understand that, thank God, we get together, but we don't have to necessarily get together, uh, and we're going to continue to do that on Sunday, and we're going to do that on Wednesday, but you need to know that you can host the presence of God in your home. You can host the presence of God in your car. You can host the presence of God on your job, and I believe what people are beginning to learn that, that, that and I'm seeing men that wasn't taking the leadership. I'm seeing women without husbands that are getting their kids together and they're hosting the presence of God in their home and I thank God I've been seeing this crazy t-shirt and it says the church has left the building. It ain't just because they went to the car. The church, the true church of the living God, the saints of God, the blood bought, the blood washed children of God are beginning to walk around and the church has left the building so we can host the presence of God. We are the tabernacle. We are the tabernacle of God that God has put on this planet to let our light shine that wherever we go, just like Moses' tabernacle, wherever we go, we host the presence and people feel the presence of God. Guys, I was back there in the office just a while ago and they started singing and I, I was just, I was just, I'm just itching. I'm just scratching. I don't have a rash. It's not a new disease, okay? But I was just, I was just itching because I wanted to get out. And I'm walking around, and I'm hearing the praise and worship, and I'm seeing people outside their car. I'm seeing them with their hands lifted, and I just stand there and start crying. And it reminded me so, so many years ago of this, of this, this outside of them preaching. They used to have something with really taught. It was called Brush Arbors. Many of y'all remember that around this area, okay? <laughs> and uh, my brother Dean was just, he was just young in the ministry. And there was a guy, they were out in the field, and Dean preached a sermon. They had these loud speakers up like we got now. And, and, and Dean began to give the altar call. And I don't know if y'all remember those days or not, but they used to set out and uh, what, what we call the center folk. They wouldn't come out of the brush arbor, but they sit out on the tailgate of their truck. <laughs> Good to see all you sinners here today, amen. And uh, they sit out on the tailgate of the truck, and they they'd listen to the preacher. And Dean said, "I was given, I was given the altar call, and I just kept it just kept lingering, it just kept lingering, it just kept lingering, and I didn't feel like shutting." And he said, "In just a little bit, he said, I heard the barbed wire fence. <laughs> I heard it squeak, and I looked out across the moonlight." Some guy was coming across the fence and he come running as fast as he could <laughs> and he come sliding in underneath the brush arbor, began to call out to God to save him. Dean went down and laid his hand on him and then while he was sitting there praying, all of a sudden a pickup truck come flying up in the field, barely even got the thing stopped, the door flew open and she come, a woman got out of the truck and come and fell down beside the man, prayed them both through to salvation and when they got up, that Dean said, what's going on? What's your testimony? He said, you've got to be the loud mouth this preacher I've ever heard in my life he said I live on the other side of that hill right over there and those two hollers and he said I sat there and listened to you preach and the word just kept coming to me and coming to me and I felt the conviction and he said when you said who wants to get saved come forward I told the wife to go get the keys to the truck and she was gone too long looking for the keys he said I climbed that hill across the creek I came across that fence and I came across two hollers and she pulled up in the truck but he said I'm saved and guys listen to me that is beginning that's not just an old story to make you happy that actually happened and now we have become so complacent of where that we are we become so complacent with our with our with our with our, with our, uh, with our relaxation with our comfortability and we was we were so complacent but this has begun to get us to realize that gathering together that again I was glad David said when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord so that when we leave the building in just a few weeks time when we walk outside we're we're gonna walk out with a spring in our step. We're gonna walk out with a new touch and anointing. We're gonna walk out with something brand new that when we begin to see people, we can tell them it's not a fairy tale. It's not dead. It's still relevant that Jesus Christ is the answer. Somebody give him a loud praise in here today. Hallelujah. It's still relevant today. And I'm afraid <laughs> it's something that we had forgotten that the message 
of the blood of Jesus still saves you from your sin. I know there's critics. I was doing a study in here the other day and I was reading about Moses and the mess that Moses got himself in. Yes, he got himself in a mess. Moses goes on. Did anybody see the teaching I done about the 10 plagues? If, if, if you ain't seen that, you need to go watch it. <laughs> the 10 plagues of how that all 10 plagues, we have seen and visited all 10 of them before Passover this year, just like they did the night that the angel came through and the firstborn passed away. And I'm telling you guys, you listen to me and I'm gonna say it live right here. This summer is gonna bring an incredible change. And by this fall, I'm telling you, I believe late, late August, early September on the Jewish calendar somewhere around Rosh Hashanah, this economy is gonna go through the sky it is going to increase. It is going to be better than it was. I believe that people are going to have to start hiring more people. Bosses, employers are going to have to start hiring people because God is seeing the heart of the nation of America. Now, those that don't want to be a part of it, he'll pass them by. But it is God does not look on the outward appearance. You know that. He looks at the heart. And what God has seen is people in America that is hungry to be in the house of God and hungry to be in his presence. And I was doing my study the other day on, on Moses, on, on, uh, on, the, on the menorah. And Moses is there on the menorah. And, uh, and I, I was doing my study and I got to look at some of the miracles. Man, it would take 1,500. 1,500 tons, Brother Darrell, take 1,500 tons of manna a day to, just to keep that many people from dying. And they had more than they needed. If they ate on America's standards, it would be 4,000 tons of manna a day. You know, the, the, fear, <laughs> the fear that hit and the runs that people made on the grocery store, which, by the way, what was the deal with toilet paper? I, I don't know. I guess if you digested it, it cured Corona. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't I know what what it was. It was a run on toilet paper, and I, and I, you know, I'd think there ought to be a run on green beans or something. You know, something you, you know, something that tastes good. I I went ahead and tried a, a little square of toilet paper. I had to spit it out. It was just awful. I, well, thank you, brother Todd. Appreciate that. Then, and Moses, by the hand of God at a minimum of two and a half million people was fed every week. It took 4,000 tons of manna a day to feed that many people with a plenty of a supply, okay? It took about 168 billion gallons of water over 40 years, 14,600 days to keep that many people from thirst and death along with the livestock. 168 tons, 168 billion gallons of water, about 58 million tons of manna, and we're worried that God can't handle what we're in. Man, look here. Moses leaves Egypt, and he's standing at the Red Sea. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm glad Moses didn't have a television program. I'll be glad he didn't. I can see him now, Brother Todd. All you people out there in television land, you see this stick? Bring camera in a little closer, please. You see this stick? Next week, you tune in at the same time, and I'm going to stretch this out over this red. God's going to part. The Red Sea, you make your check payable to the children of Israel. Come on, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Aren't you glad we've moved away from that nonsense? Amen? And listen, and this time that we're in has helped. Now listen, I'm one of those TV preachers. I'm not. I'm, I'm up in my business. That's when you should have honked the horn louder. Don't do it now. No, no. I knew you were making fun of me. 
You understand, I'm, I'm a part of that. But there's a shift that is taking place. And there are people that are trying to explain away. I, I literally was looking and doing some research about the Red Sea party. And I want to read you a scripture here that I've got on my little, my little iPad right here. I read about the Red Sea party. Yeah, where's that? Right here. It's in Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> and, and it says, And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. Now, that's quite a deal. You got two and a half million people crossing Red Sea. And the water had to back up three miles on both sides in order to get that many people across in a 24-hour period. And I was looking on the internet, the miracle of the Red Sea. There's all kinds of explanations. There's an earthquake. There's a land bridge. Well, that's fine. I got no problem with your explanations of how the Red Sea parted. But five times in the book of Exodus, once in the book of Psalms, and once in the book of Hebrews, it says that they crossed over. Two and a half a million people crossed over on dry ground. Now, you can do all the explanation you want to with earthquakes and different kinds of tsunamis and, and, and typhoons and land bridge. That's fine. What you going to do about the dry ground? Because you've got to understand once water parts back, that kind of muck and mire don't dry up instantly. That muck and mire had to be waist deep. But the Bible said that they walked over on dry ground. Now, <laughs> Psalms said they went over on dry ground. Hebrews said they went over on dry ground. Thank you for your explanation with physics. What you going to do about the dry ground? Well, I don't believe that part. Oh, you don't believe that part. Oh, you want to try to explain away the miracle. See, you either, you either got to believe the dry ground or you can't believe the water part. Because you got to understand, even if it was damp, Two and a half million people, time half of them got across. Mud would be knee deep. But the Bible says, Brother Todd, they went over on dry ground. I'm going to write a song. What you going to do about the dry ground? My point is, guys, when there is nothing, there is still God. And it doesn't matter how God decides to perform the miracle. It doesn't matter how God decides to end this thing that we're in. It doesn't matter how God decides to direct. It doesn't matter how God decides to point the leaders. It doesn't matter how God tries to do whatever he wants to do. You just have to understand that by faith, that when I call on him, when I call on him, you sang that song, there's power in prayer, power to spare all that you'll ever need is waiting right there. And I'm going to challenge you today and just tell you in this simple little message, not deep theology, just a simple little message of encouragement to tell you that God still got this. And when there doesn't seem like any way out, <laughs> it doesn't seem like you know where to turn. When there is nothing there is still God. Would you give the Lord praise today? Would you do that? Come on, give him praise. <laughs>